Hi everyone, welcome to our new episode of Heartbeats, a platform where we discuss social initiatives and topics that Singaporeans care about. I'm your host Audrey. And I am your co-host, Nikki. So today we have invited a very spe- special guest speaker, uh, Matt Woon, the founder of Asset, a social enterprise that looks into solutions to improve the mental well-being of youth. Um, and what they do is that they provide anonymous text-based therapy and conducting research and training for organizations. So we know that you know COVID-19 has uh, disrupted the in school interactions between peers and like in various institutions you know, from primary school all the way up to university and you know other institutions and there's been uh, teens or like youth have to deal with the additional stress and anxiety you know, mental health challenges because of uh, all these uh, compounding factors so and, and as I said you know you and your team will strive to improve mental health well-being of youth by providing anonymous chat-based therapy as well as you know, other services. So yeah, we have met today and to start off the whole discussion, maybe you can just tell us what inspired you to start uh, Asset. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Uh, I, I would say that Asset is really a digital infrastructure. I think we are trying to be the customized uh, solution that can optimize, you know, like peer support. And this starts from providing really good training so that students are empowered with the skills and uh, the capabilities to uh, adequately support and meet the needs of their peers, their friends who reach out or going through a difficult time or, or when they need to kind of like process uh, difficulties uh, in the emotions and whatnot. Really, the, the, the concept of asset boils down to like the, like the word asset itself uh, comprises the word uh, asset and reset. And uh, the vision really is to empower youth uh, and students to accept care and reset lives. And I guess that's really um, something that gave the company a lot of focus. Um, and a lot of the work that we do is inspired by how do we achieve this mission and solve this problem of improving access to care. Um, and at that time, I think 2015, 2016, uh, it's very hard to kind of like put technology and mental health uh, together. I think if you talk to any counsellor, any uh, educators at that time, uh, their belief is that uh, face-to-face support is the most important part uh, when it comes to mental health recovery or like uh, attending to any student issues. Uh, But I think that there really is potential to look at how students can play a more active and essential role beyond looking out for signs of danger and uh, linking them to uh, the adults and the counsellors to do the work. So I guess that's also where like Reset Lives comes in. Um, and I think the idea here is when it comes to Reset Lives is you have a set of experience. Uh, life dealt you with certain cards and you're conditioned in a certain way. Um, and when you fit certain symptoms, uh, it can be considered potentially as depression or anxiety. But on the flip side, uh, these experiences also give you unique insights and training. You develop certain skill set. And I'm interested to know those positive things that make you more productive and more competitive in certain areas. How do we then harness that, feed that back into building a better company, a better work culture, um, and solve these mental health problems together. Um, so I guess that's something that I'm still learning. Uh, in 2020, I found an organization that was really honest, Welcome Trust Foundation. They say, look, you know, for all the signs and for all the funding, I still don't know what's the cause of root cause. I can't like pinpoint like in a scientific way, like if you have, uh, for example, STD, you do a blood test or whatnot, you can like, there's no argument about it, right? It's an objective science, but mental health is not an objective science. You can't like blood test, okay, we have depression. So we, we don't know what's the exact cause. We don't know what's the exact solution. Uh, but if you have a good idea, let me know. Uh, we look through a proposal with Fund And I, I think I was on that project with NUS. Very thankful that they sponsored, supported this thing. And it really gave us an insight into um, how we can better understand and address mental health issues. And, and I think that's really what 
inspire me to continue this work because it's a real problem. Uh, it needs a real solution. And I, I think that kind of process uh, creates really good growth opportunities for everyone involved. Right, right. So yeah, I think it was very interesting when you talked about like mental health not being an objective science. You know? So it takes more than just uh, you know, a diagnosis. There's no diagnosis or whatever going on. It really takes a lot of effort and constant outreach, even from peer to peer level and everything to kind of like you know, talk to people and, and find out more from them. So, you know, based on your experiences, uh, you know, is mental health a, a serious, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, issue in Singapore? I, I would say that um, mental health, uh, that the ones that I think we paid uh, a lot of attention to is uh, the perhaps the really severe ones. Uh, and like maybe you need to fit like uh, certain symptoms, certain criteria. Um, maybe like if you do a evidence kind of like questionnaire, you need to have a score of at least 15 to qualify for depression or anxiety. Of course, there are other like ways to uh, look at it. Um, but I would say that with advancements in internet and the pace of change, um, I think there's a lot of stress that uh, comes along with this transition. Uh, something that I guess maybe we experience more closely is COVID-19 and how we had to ad make adjustments um, along the way. And I would say that it's increasingly a more um, prevalent uh, issue um, from all quarters. Like maybe five years ago, um, it, I have a lot of education to, to put it out like to the stakeholders um, the educators, the, the, the counselors or whoever, right? Or even to my fellow uh, colleague and peers that this is something we should work on together. Today, you don't have to like do the same kind of education. I think people can see that this is a problem. They can see how um, the same way of working is not sustainable. And they start to question like uh, whether uh, they need more work-life balance and whatnot. So, I think from that perspective, you can say that uh, more people are aware of how their emotional state um, can affect their function. And in that perspective, you can say that it is uh, something that is being given more attention, mental well-being issues. Yeah, I actually agree with you. Um, I mean, I, I, I do think that definitely more people are aware now. Um, and it's quite crazy because previously, if you talk about maybe five to 10 years ago, mental health is sometimes viewed as a taboo topic, right? Or at least an uncomfortable one where people are not willing to speak about it. But then if you look at the scene now, it is changing. More and more people are willing to speak out and talk about it. So, and, and of course, this is also more prevalent when you see more support systems around Singapore trying to create a safe space to talk about mental health. Just like what um, ASSET is doing right now, it really focuses a lot on text-based therapy, whereby youth are able to also confide about their problems anonymously to even a trained befriender, like what you said, as you, as you want to equip the skills to, to people, right? So I guess also based on some of the works that ASSET has done, what are some common uh, mental health issues that you have uncovered just by, you know, just interacting with you or even um, being based on your experience? Yeah, what, what are some common mental health issues among the youths in Singapore? Okay, uh, for, I, I can't go like very specific on this. So, but I can say like on an aggregate uh, basis, uh, I have seen a lot of expression of distress uh, and sadness. Um, so these are emotions that are tied to very specific uh, contextual challenges. So it could be um, finding difficulty to adjust to the pace of work in a new uh, school environment. Uh, there could be a mismatch of expectation or skill set. Uh, they thought it was like this, but in that, like that, and they are stuck. Um, there are also cases where, um, you know, like I, I would say that 
uh, people are uncertain uh, and they find it difficult to break out of their shell to reach out, um, connect with communities, uh, find meaningful uh, friends and, and they are wondering how people around them could just so easily gel into this. And I think with COVID-19, um, I see more of this, like, how do I find my place and connect with, find my community and connect with the people and, and, and make sense of everything. Um, there are also like issues around uh, increased workload as a result of uh, COVID-19 uh, coming in. Um, there are not many cases that come in to specifically talk about anxiety or specifically talk about uh, depression or other mental disorder. And I would say that uh, this could also be because maybe in many people's mind, the letter writing is they want to talk about life experiences rather than just uh, a part of uh, like a illness or a condition. Uh, and I would say it, when it comes to addressing mental health issues, uh, one thing that for asset we try to do differently is uh, we try to focus less on the risk factors. Um, so we are not looking at analysis of what your trigger points are, what causes you stress, where's the problem. Um, if I can put it like in a more uh, in an analogy, when you have flu, um, we don't try to like analyze what causes the flu, how to prevent the flu. Um, when you have flu, you take tablet. So, uh, and in assets case, we are trying to look at protective factors. Okay, when you have a sad day, what can help you to recover and bounce back faster? Good friends, good conversation, meaning. So let's work towards that. I, I think that's really how we're trying to add value uh, to today's uh, conversations around mental health and uh, peer support systems. I think those are really insightful, especially since um, you don't only focus on the problem itself, but you also try to think of certain um, tactics or I would say positive reinforcement, right? To make the people think that um, having a certain issue is not, is not um, a problem, but instead you can actually see it in a positive light or even a different, a, a different light. So I do think that um, based on what you say, perception is very important. And also, I just want to bring up that um, the fact that you talk about COVID-19 is something that I can relate really well because I'm currently working. And I do think that because of this situation, workload naturally increased because um, the boundaries between the work and your life, sometimes it, it gets blurred. So a lot of the people that I know as well, they, they do face a slight burnout from work. So definitely agree with what you said. So, so I guess, right, um, I mean, since we're, we're even on the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and you did also mention that um, perhaps that could be one of the reasons um, people are actually seeking mental health support. So I just want to know um, your thoughts about, you know, this whole situation and what, what do you think um, we can potentially do to improve this situation or, you know, just um, go about looking into this? I mean, with COVID-19, uh you are looking at two different forces at play. So first is you are looking at the presence of um, negative experience. I, I don't know about you, but whenever the prime minister talk, I don't, I, I don't like look forward to it because I don't know whether it's a, something good or something bad. Maybe because the first time he talked right there, he's like, oh, you know, lockdown and uh, every time the news come out, there was a period where you're so jaded. You know, I, I don't want to like hear any report about how many uh, extra cases we have. So I think that's one force at play. Presence of uh, negative experiences. Oh, then you have to like do the PCR just to attend the wedding because you're not vaccinated and that kind of stuff, right? Um, the other force at play is the absence of positive experience. Yeah, I used to be able to hang out. Now I cannot. Um, I used to be able to uh, go to office and 
maybe go to my library to do my thing because uh, my house has no aircon. Now I'm stuck at home. Uh, I come from a big family. I live in a small unit and now like, I need to stay at home the whole time, for example. So um, everybody have had their own routine in yesterday's world. And some of those routine, uh, you can't like execute them in the new world. Um, and I think it really adds a lot of stress to families, to individuals that come from low resource environment. Um, you will feel it more if you don't have Wi-Fi at home, for example. So maybe last time you can go out to McDonald's and tap on wireless at SG, do your Netflix or your Mi Watch or whatnot. And those routine being able to consume uh, video content keeps you safe. Now you're stuck at home and your house has no Wi-Fi. That's very stressful, right? Like, so I think that's what I would see as COVID-19. Um, maybe people are reaching out also because they realize, hey, I need new routine. I need a way to experience this um, positive thing, even if it's very weird to meet my friend on Zoom. And then like, we don't know what to do on Zoom the first time like we meet, like what do we talk about? What games do we play? We have to try because otherwise I would just go crazy, you know, every day stay at home and do nothing. So I think that's the kind of change that uh, all of us have to grapple with. Um, but it is also something that I felt from a business standpoint uh, was very good. I don't have to explain to a lot of people about a lot of things. Last time, cannot work from home, right? Uh, if you work from home, that means you're not taking my student interns seriously. Your work is not serious. I have so much to explain. Now it's, oh, work from home. Yes, please work from home, you know? Um, last time, maybe you have uh, to explain a lot about the value of technology in a digital service, especially for mental health. Now with COVID-19, yeah, like um, it's an acceptable uh, mode. So I think mindsets are also changing along with uh, the change in the environment and circumstances, which I think is a good thing for, um, I guess, like for asset. And I will also say one other thing about COVID-19 is potentially I think people are scrolling more, consuming more or producing more uh, online social media content some are good, some are not so good, but I can, I can see from talking to different stakeholders that um, social media content may not always be very healthy uh, for consumption. Uh, so there is a team that looks at all this uh, content moderation and it can be very heavy sometimes for them to have to like filter through unsafe content. Yeah. So I think that's also something that came up quite strongly as a result of COVID-19. Right, right. So I think uh, some key points that you touched on was like, you know, the change in lifestyle. So the way we work, the way we live, it's all has been kind of like dramatically changed. You know, and the perceptions, I like the point where you talk about the perceptions of working from home or doing things remotely has uh, like, you know, changed from a, you're not really doing your, not sure if you're doing your work to be, you know, uh, just, do what's comfortable and be productive in your own space, right? So, you know, as a university student, we have some of these kind of uh, different, different kind of uh, like activities that are done. For example, you know, sometimes we have our lessons remotely or have our meetings remotely. And, you know, it, it might cause a strain on students because you know, when you come into university, you know, orientation is like a period where you really meet new people, you know, exciting opportunities and everything. But we're kind of like restricted to uh, limited face-to-face -face interactions nowadays, you know? So uh, for the, the majority of our audience, which are mainly like you know, youth to young working adults, you know, what's, if you are, uh, like, uh, peer, you see that your peer needs like mental health support, you know, then uh, how could you possibly reach out to them uh, some ways? Uh, one thing I would say is uh, the students who use my platform tells me, they complain, uh, they say the orientation no longer fun. Then they'll say like, oh, you know, my, my OG asked me to share like awkward story online and I don't know what to do with him or her. Um, and I would also say that uh, the whole approach to work, how we organize our work and student life also um, changes a lot. So it used to be that 
maybe last time at work you have to like micromanage, right? Uh to get things done. Now you want to micromanage, you cannot, you know, like uh people are all remote. You can't hold people by a leash. And I would say that for uh student life, um maybe last time there were more offline opportunities like go for this event, go for that event, uh to make friends. Uh I think for today's uh university students, uh they they will want to look into um other opportunities or ways to form that um common bond, like find points where you can kind of relate and connect with each other. Uh I think people are looking for meaningful experiences, like uh purposeful thoughts. And uh I think in today's time, uh I think the ones who kind of like are more reflexive, reflective and thoughtful, uh, they will find more opportunities to uh make friends and suppose um you are in that position where people trust you, they come to you, or you see somebody who is uh, distressed, I think it's helpful to uh, know like you can do a few things for your friend. First is when you reach out, you might not be very certain what that emotion or the challenge they are facing. But I think when you reach out and you try to like maybe uh, unpack or understand or just try to like show your concern, uh, it can be a good and healthy distraction for your friend, whether or not like you hit the bullseye, but at least you whack the target, you know what I mean? Just by hitting the target is a good like achievement unlocked for your friend who is like struggling or having a hard time. Um, beyond being a healthy distraction, what I think students can do for each other is really, you know, um, recognizing that with COVID-19, new problems emerge. So we shouldn't be surprised if there are people who are under the weather because of new problems emerging from new contexts and situation. So maybe last time, don't have to deal with this kind of shit. But now COVID-19, oh, have to deal with this new problem, right? And then um, you find that some problems are, they become more solvable when you have somebody to bounce ideas with. And I think that's what, as a friend, you can do, giving some suggestions without solving the problem for the other people. And that could be the new mode of engagement. So yes, uh, the value, the connection forms when we can both share in the experience of overcoming a challenge together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I hope like in that way, it also gives certain input on what, what can possibly change. Uh, I think last time we can just, yeah, maybe go to this activity or that activity. The activity and the, the larger environment, the nightlife, the, the experiences, we don't have to do a lot of work. We just have to be there, right? Um, but now all these things being cut back. Then I think a lot of those activities and experiences that can form that, human connection has to come from within. Yeah. And I think that's one change that that uh, COVID-19 has sort of imposed upon us. Yeah. Hmm. So um so Matt, so based on, on what you said, right? We we talk a lot about reaching out, um, importance of making connections and all. So I, I do get that. I, I do think that that is important as well. Um, but what about you know in our own um our own perspective. For example, what, what, what do you think are some ways that can help if, you know, um, to improve my own mental health, like your own mental health, um, aside from also reaching out to people who have uh, potentially mental health issues? I would say that it first starts from uh, an, an awareness of, uh, of the kind of emotions uh, that is happening and how it's linked to a specific event. So when something is really triggering, okay, I think we will like, as humans, we will all like react very angry. Well, send the angry, you don't care. But at some point, uh, being able to say, ah, okay, that thing that happened, 
I felt this way, maybe the first few times, the first few people I talk to, you're just saying it as it is, but there will be a point where, okay, I am maybe less like emotionally uh, vulnerable and not so um, maybe impulsive or whatnot. Like you can really process and say, okay, I was, I was feeling this way. Like this is my emotion. Maybe a mixture of worry, mixture of anger, or it was fear, or it was just really upset. Uh, but I think being able to name that emotion uh, is the first step towards um, a better like self-management. Because then, for example, if you identify the target, this is fear, right? Like fear is messing my mind up. Then when you want to process fear, you find that, okay, I can do certain things to start to test this a little bit. Can I gradually uh, do certain things to help me fear this uh, thing a little bit less? And you find that gradual confrontation exposure helps you to process and eventually control, overcome the fear. So I, I guess it, to your question about um, mental well-being, I think that, that effective awareness, like knowing that, oh, like I'm a little bit messed up today by my emotions is a good first step. So, so that it also gives yourself that consent to let the emotion run its course. Yeah. Rather than feeling even more uncertain and having more negative uh, emotions and thoughts compound your entire day to the point where you cannot function. Yeah. So I think that would be what I, I, I would suggest yeah, as a first step. They have to talk to people, you know, like uh, quality social connection uh, I, I, is such that, that the human touch you can't really substitute. Uh, I would argue, in fact, that healing is really a, um, like for healing to happen, uh, the supportive, warm relationship uh, is really a critical process. Yeah, there's no substitute for human touch, and there's uh, no no substitute for love, lah. Yeah, and being kind persons. Yeah, I totally agree. <clears throat> I totally agree that connection is something that is extremely powerful, and um, you know, just even a slight hint of interaction, it really makes a lot of difference. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for one, uh, sharing these wonderful tips, Matt. Um, I do think that it's very important for all of us Singaporeans to really understand what mental health is and also the different ways that we can approach it in order to increase our mental health being. So like what you said, um, first step is definitely awareness, understanding your emotions before even reaching out to um, people having a connection because that's where um, you really get to face your problem and try to understand uh, where the root cause is. So thanks for having us. Um, really, really appreciate it so much. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having me. So thanks everyone for joining us today and see you on another session of Heartbeats.